I don't like what you're doing to my friends in there. It's messed up. So I'm gonna mess you up. From late 2003 to 2008, the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise went through a bit of an identity crisis. From declining critical reception to lackluster sales, Sonic Team seemed to fumble around, unable to grasp what gamers of the day were craving. From the team mechanic in Heroes, to gunplay in Shadow, to realistic graphics in Sonic 06, and finally the Werehog in Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Team was chasing their collective tail, trying to win back the hearts of the mainstream gamer. Little did Sonic Team realize they were not alone, and the 3D platforming genre had basically run its course. Outside of the Mario franchise, platformers were fading fast, not unlike maze games from the 80s or shmups in the 90s. Sure, the genre still existed, but 3D platformers had become a niche genre. The open world sandbox game had fully taken over mainstream gaming in the 2000s, and mainstays like Crash and Spyro had basically died. Rather than trying to turn Sonic into an open-world sandbox game, Sonic Team finally seemed to accept Sonic's fate as a niche franchise, and in 2010, Sonic Colors was released to the world. And miraculously, Sonic Team's restraint was rewarded by gamers and critics alike. IGN, who had been particularly harsh on the Blue Blur's 3D outings, scored the game an 8.5 out of 10, declaring, There are a few issues that mar an otherwise awesome experience, but those shouldn't stop Sonic fans and Wii owners from grabbing the best Sonic game in 18 years. GameSpot agreed, scoring the game an 8 out of 10, noting, Sonic Colors offers a mix of 3D action and classic Sonic side-scrolling with dazzling visuals and exhilarating platforming. It wasn't just the old dogs that praised the game. In a 2010 video, YouTuber Some Call Me Johnny stated, Sonic Colors is incredibly fun and should be in every Sonic fan's collection. So, after eight years, is Sonic Colors still worthy of the critical acclaim? Or is it beginning to show its age? Let's take a look. Sonic Colors opens with an epic 7-minute cutscene. Actually, it doesn't. Sonic Colors begins with gameplay. Rather than spelling things out, the players actually left to develop some of their own conclusions. The backgrounds show off an amusement park, and Earthly Body is clearly visible in the background. Eggman's voice can be heard on the PA system, and robots are waving welcome signs. While I appreciate the epic cinematic openings of both Sonic 06 and Sonic Unleashed, the opening segments in Sonic Colors are the developer's way of letting players know the gameplay is going to be the focus of the adventure, with the story bits playing second fiddle. This is reinforced with Tropical Resort Act 2 beginning immediately after Act 1. It is not until completing the first two acts where some plot is finally revealed. It turns out Sonic and Tails are at Eggman's incredible interstellar amusement park, and Sonic recognizes immediately there is an evil plot to foil. After admiring Eggman's amazing park, the the action is interrupted by two of Eggman's henchmen chasing little aliens around with nets and lasers. Sonic, being the upstanding citizen he is, swoops in and rescues them. One of them then melds with Sonic or something and Sonic ricochets across the park. Later on, the player learns Eggman is using these little aliens, called Wisps, as a power source for his evil plans. In a touching moment later on, the Wisps beg Sonic and Tails to save them. So, like usual, there is a hero hero, a villain, and a mission, so let's get going. The gameplay in Sonic Colors is pretty much the same as the 3D boost gameplay introduced in Sonic Unleashed. The first gimmick in Sonic Colors is the ability to break the sound barrier after filling the boost meter. A minor tweak is made, however. The meter is filled by nabbing a specific color wisp capsule, rather than collecting rings. The other minor tweak is the inclusion of a double jump, theoretically allowing the player to leap further or higher, but most often used to make mid-air corrections. Finally, the stomp, slide kick, and homing attack all make their return. What is new, however, are the Wisp powers. Not only do they allow Sonic to go super fast, different colored ones will give the player one-time unique abilities. First is the Cyan Wisp, granting the player the laser power. This can be used to ricochet off specific objects, laser through hordes of enemies, or enter certain tubes. The Yellow Wisp allows Sonic to drill through designated ground areas like dirt, 
or cake. While underground, the player can smash through certain blocks and again enter shortcut tubes. There are also underground enemies to be destroyed. The Orange Wisp is a rocket, which launches Sonic high into the air, then allowing him to skydive towards the ground. The Blue Wisp will flip certain cube blocks from solid to not solid, creating alternate pathways through levels in addition to destroying certain blocks. The Green Wisp allows Sonic to hover or fly, as well as ring dash across lines of rings. It's worth noting Sonic's traditional light speed dash is absent in the game. The Pink Wisp turns Sonic into spikes. In this form, Sonic can climb up walls, homing attack enemies, and perform the spin dash. Finally, the Purple Wisp is Frenzy, turning Sonic into a purple monster that can eat through certain destructible objects. I should note these power-ups are all temporary and timed, so one could not stay in Spike forever, unless the stage is filled with the appropriate capsule refilling the meter. More important, however, the Wisp powers are a quick way to rack up points, as seen in the upper right side of the screen. Finally, the player will notice a ton of empty capsules along their journey. It is not until the Wisp is effectively unlocked during the course of the game that these initially empty capsules will be filled with the power-up. Not all powers are created equal, however, as they are generally situational, and many limited to just the 2D side-scrolling sections. Speaking of limited to 2D sections, a majority of Sonic Colors is side-scrolling, and the 3D sections harken back to the Crash Bandicoot series, being limited to pathways rather than being open areas lending to exploration. And this is a source of a lot of friction when discussing Sonic Colors today. Back in 2010, the Sonic franchise was nearly two decades old, meaning there was at least two generations of Sonic fans. This includes a generation who grew up on the Genesis titles, and a generation who grew up on the 6th generation titles. Needless to say, though the 2D does an admirable job capturing the spirit of the Genesis games, I'm not certain I could say the 3D sections capture the spirit of the adventure titles. Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing is certainly up for debate, but I think it's worth pointing out the state of the Sonic landscape at the time. Anyway, in addition to the plot, Sonic Colors shed some other things as well. Hub worlds are again absent and replaced with map screens. Eggman's incredible interstellar amusement park is made up of multiple planets, which is presumably where the Wisps come from. After beating Axe, new planets are unlocked, each containing six Axe and a boss fight, all selectable from a super simple map screen. Also missing are medals, meaning there is no collecting goals to be met to access new Axe. The simpler level structure, lack of hub worlds, and linear game progression creates an extremely streamlined game structure not seen since the Genesis titles or Sonic Adventure 2. Moving along, let's talk about the various planets. Much like Sonic Unleashed chose to use real-world locales to try and mix up the classic platforming set pieces, Sonic Colors uses both the amusement park theme as well as alien planets to create an interesting set of locales to race through that are both familiar but sufficiently different. Tropical Resort is the typical first zone with lush greenery, but rather than an ocean backdrop, the level steal cues from Casino Night with plenty of neon and a nighttime set. Seeing the world in the background is also pretty rad and lets the player know they are out in space. Sweet Mountain is a world made up of sweet treats, popcorn, hamburgers, and plenty of industrial machinery, almost like a futuristic bakery. Starlight Carnival takes place both out in space as well as inside spaceships. Whether inside or outside, these acts feel like being at a music festival, complete with massive speakers in the background, while other areas are behind the scenes industrial environments. Planet Wisp looks like an alien planet before Eggman has sucked all of the resources out of it. It is also the only level that feels organic. Aquarium Park is the game's water world with Asian themes. Astro Coaster is a twist on a lava theme with the hot stuff being green rather than red. And of course, it features some roller coasters. Finally, there is Terminal Velocity, which is comprised of a few small races down the space elevator Eggman built to reach his theme park. The unique Alien twists, emphasis on space, and the industrial theme park motifs give Sonic Colors a unique look and style, and the game ends up feeling refreshing rather than rehashed.
As Sonic Colors progresses, little snippets of the plot continue to be presented. As expected, Eggman's incredible interstellar amusement park is in fact part of an evil scheme. Eggman has developed a mind control beam and he plans to use it on everyone in the universe. For those who remember Batman Forever, this is basically the Riddler's box invention, continuing Sonic Team's trend of playing homage to American cinema. One thing I did notice about the cutscenes upon closer inspection is compression artifacts. It turns out the cutscenes are not actually real time, despite using the in-game engine. My best guess is they weren't able to implement certain lighting effects real time and instead added them in post-production, like the glowing antenna on Tails' tablet or the glow of the robot teeth. Theoretically, the Wii should be powerful enough to handle effects like these in real time, and the lights in-game do have subtle glows, so maybe this isn't the answer, but it does point to a bigger issue with the graphics as a whole. Sonic Colors runs at 30 frames per second instead of 60. When combined with the 480p resolution of the Wii, Sonic Colors looks significantly worse than the game released two years prior. One could use an emulator along with an action replay code to play this in proper high definition at 60 frames per second, or inject the colors levels into the PC port of Sonic Generations for significant boosts in fidelity. But the only retail version of Sonic Colors as of this video is starting to look a little dated from a technical standpoint. The art direction, on the other hand, is excellent. Like the games before it and its namesake, Sonic Colors is popping with color. From the greens in Tropical Resort, the pinks of Sweet Mountain, the neons of Starlight Carnival, the reds and greens of Planet Wisp, the primaries of Aquarium Park, and the greens of Asteroid Coaster, Sonic Team did an awesome job using vibrant colors and the appropriate accents to really make each world pop off the screen. The texture work is excellent as well. Textures are sharp and really soft and again harken back to the classic series with patterns of geometric shapes. Level geometry is also terrific. While platforms are often blocky, they contrast nicely with the detailed backgrounds, giving plenty of 3D detail without things getting visually confusing. Combine this with some of the best character shadows in the series, subtle effects like shiny surfaces, ripple effects with the wisps or underwater, and motion blur during boost mode and Sonic Colors is a visually rich experience that is easy on the eyes. That said, I do wish Sonic Team had spent some time optimizing the game engine for the hardware, so this baby could zip along at 60 frames per second. I do know I let Sonic Unleashed off the hook for its frame rate, but the game's geometry, texture, and lighting work is still sensational, mitigating the issue somewhat. Still, I hope and suspect Sega will release an HD remaster for the game, much like they did for the adventure games. What isn't compromised by the Wii hardware is the soundtrack. Again, Sonic Team delivered on the audio and the soundtrack in Sonic Colors is rich, varied, catchy, and memorable. It's also worth noting, while each of the game's worlds has a single song, each is remixed twice, so no more than two acts ever share the same exact composition or instrument selection. Tropical Resort features an upbeat, poppy arrangement with tropical sounding string instruments along with plenty of synthesized dance rhythms. Sweet Mountain sounds like a high school marching band or orchestra fused with California surfing music. Starlight Carnival is a techno sound with synthesized instruments and heavy bass, yet the melodies start off somewhat subdued and slowly build into an epic chorus. Planet Wisp gives off New Age vibes, but the energy is heightened with prominent piano notes or guitar strums. The somber tone with the high energy notes match perfectly with the destruction of the planet and Sonic's speedy nature. Aquarium Park is another stunning piece with power pop vibes and some of the catchiest melodies found in the entire game. Asteroid Coaster is the rock portion of Sonic Colors with electric guitar sounds giving a distinct nod to Sonic Adventure 2. There is also Wisp specific music and some wonderfully orchestrated boss tunes. From top to bottom beginning to end, Sonic Colors is a treat for the ears and I honestly can't find a single fault.
voice acting is also terrific. Mike Pollock returns to play Eggman with the perfect blend of sinister villain with dim-witted charm. Sonic and Tails feature new voices, as Sega was never able to secure or chose not to secure the same voices to retain some sort of continuity in the franchise. In any case, Tails is probably the best he's ever been, featuring the childish sound he's always had, but with a newfound sense of confidence that has been at times lacking in the series. Sonic 2 sounds great, with the right mix of angst, cockiness, confidence, and charm one would expect from the blue blur. Well, who am I kidding? We both knew how this would end. Uh, are you talking to the broken robot who can't hear you? Uh... So, with all of that out of the way, we arrive back to the question asked at the beginning of the video. Is Sonic Colors still worthy of the critical acclaim, or is it beginning to show its age? First, let me say Sonic Colors gives a great first impression. Thankfully, the first time I played and beat Sonic Colors over four years ago, I wrote about it, so I can recall what a first playthrough is like. Past me was impressed. I was impressed with the responsive controls, delighted the camera issues were non-existent, and pleased with the lack of collision issues or other glitches. I enjoyed the seamless transition from 3D to 2D gameplay mid-level, and thought the Wisp powers fit right in with the gameplay. I liked the amusement park landscape and lighthearted story. Finally, I appreciated the attention to detail, and was happy to not wander about hub worlds wondering where to go next. Yeah, it didn't take much to impress me back in 2013, but it does demonstrate what an average person might experience on a first playthrough, and with that mindset, it doesn't surprise me Sonic Colors was well received by the mainstream press. But I'm not here to talk about first impressions. First, I want to give credit where credit is due. For the first time since the early 90s, Sega finally managed to capture some of that Nintendo magic. Sonic Colors is an exceptionally playable game that gamers of all skill levels can easily dive into. The game mechanics are simple, level construction makes it obvious how to progress forward, and there are no upgrades or hub worlds adding barriers to new levels. Instead of relying on gimmicks to appeal to mainstream gamers like 12,000 characters so everyone in the world can find one to relate to, or adding guns and edginess because that's what other companies were doing, or adding adult themes to appeal to the increasing age of the average gamer, Sega instead just made a platforming game that anyone could pick up and play. However, this is also the biggest downfall with Sonic Colors. Nintendo has nailed the art of replayability, giving veteran gamers collectibles, secrets, and extra levels to challenge more experienced gamers. Sonic Colors doesn't quite get this right. There are two extra things to do on repeat playthroughs. Find the five secret rings hidden in every act, and complete each act with an S rank. Both of these tasks are intricately tied to wisps. Generally, it isn't possible to get all of the secret rings on a first playthrough, as parts of the levels are not accessible until the appropriate wisp is unlocked. Sadly, finding secret rings is then just a game of hide and seek. A newly unlocked drill wisp is a sign it's time to drill down, and sure enough, there is a secret ring. Other times, enemies need to be cleared to reveal a secret ring, but again, this isn't challenging, one just needs to be observant. The same goes for the S ranks. Getting an S rank doesn't revolve around finishing an act with a ton of rings in a short amount of time. Rather, it mostly revolves around having a high score. Collecting those red rings and using wisp powers is the easiest way to score massive point bonuses, and since many Wisp capsules will respawn indefinitely, earning these formerly prestigious S ranks is at times ridiculously easy. And this is my biggest gripe with Sonic Colors. Once one gets past the fact Sonic Team didn't make any major mistakes, there just isn't a ton of substance here. There is almost no difficulty progression to be found. The final acts of Asteroid Coaster aren't any more difficult than the opening stages in Tropical Resort. Skills learned in previous stages are rarely built upon and made tougher in later segments. Even the quick time events are streamlined from tough reflex challenges to mashing a single button. It's clear Sonic Team was listening to the fans and the critics and they did a nice job creating a frustration-free experience, but they also forgot to flesh out the game with challenging and engaging 
levels or side quests. While taking notes during my recorded run, I just wasn't finding many interesting mechanics or design elements to complement. 3D sections are relegated to either drifting around turns, avoiding slow moving obstacles, or simply boosting to nab rings and destroy enemies. The quick step returns, but rather than utilizing the shoulder buttons of the classic controller or triggers of the GameCube controller, the player needs to nudge the joystick left or right, which is a little slow and more awkward. There just isn't much going on beyond jumping over steps, which literally trip up Sonic. Thankfully, the 2D sections offer more depth. I like how if a player saves their boost instead of wasting it, they can zip through these lollipop sections. I appreciate how there is a fast alternative to the obstacle, however other sections are slow, involving pressing a button and then waiting, hardly engaging gameplay. There are strange control decisions as well. The double jump and homing attack are the same button, meaning it can be all too easy to attack an enemy when one was expecting to jump higher. Speaking of homing attacks, I swear the reticle is often a little delayed, and I would occasionally homing attack too early and then run into an enemy. Some could say this this is just poor play, but something about it feels sloppy. Sonic can now jump indefinitely underwater, which is neither as satisfying as obeying gravity nor as satisfying as swimming, and completely eliminates any sense of platforming as the player meshes the jump button. I do appreciate the alternate paths most levels contain, but rarely do these require any sort of skill to reach. Rather, the player just needs to notice they are there. Rewarding skillful play with shortcuts is good game design. Having branching paths for the sake of having branching paths, not so much. Even the boss fights are easy. The first six, one for each of the six worlds, are all a cakewalk. This ferris wheel thing is a joke, requiring the player to homing attack the center while occasionally avoiding attacks. This pirate boss is also easy, with the player first acquiring the drill wisp and then using the power to damage the boss. The third boss is a race on rails, and the player just needs to avoid the same basic attacks and then homing attack. The three boss types are then repeated with minor alterations, but are still exceptionally easy. After clearing the six worlds and the six bosses, the final moments of the game are unlocked. It seems when Sonic destroyed the first boss, a piece of the robot breached some sort of tank. At the end of the adventure, after Sonic destroys all of Eggman's power generators, Eggman laughs as he has already secured the power needed for the mind control cannon. When he goes to use said cannon, the tank from the beginning of the game explodes. Sonic and Tails then need to head back to the world before the park explodes. From here, there is a quick jaunt down part of the elevator before Eggman stops Sonic in his tracks. Sonic then pushes Tails into an elevator for a safe escape back to the world, and the final boss encounter occurs. The final boss is another on-rails fight. Eggman will launch Wisp-inspired attacks at Sonic, and the player needs to avoid the attacks. If successful, one can move in for an attack. With each successful loop, Wisps are freed and join Sonic's side. After all seven Wisp types are freed, Sonic launches a final attack. Attack, which destroys Eggman's craft. This is easily the best boss in the game as it actually tests the player's ability to recognize multiple attack patterns and react quickly, something the previous boss fights almost completely fail at. Some more thought out creations like this would have really benefited the rest of the game. In any case, with Eggman defeated, it is now Sonic's turn to return to the world. Only he fails. Thankfully, the Wisps rescue him and drop him gently down to safe ground, unlike Chip who lets Sonic fall on his face. From here, everyone high fives, the Wisps warp their planets out of orbit, Eggman laments on his latest failure, and then of course, the credits roll. While I find the level design pedestrian and the difficulty progression nearly non-existent, there are gameplay elements I do enjoy. I was prepared to talk about how poor Sonic jumps in the 2D sections, but the more I played Sonic Colors, the less problematic the jumping became. There is something extremely odd about the jump arc. The trajectory and speed seem to change just before the midway point of the jump, making it feel unpredictable and sloppy. This can lead to a lot of unnecessary double jumps as the momentum is difficult to predict. 
However, I did find if I would just trust the jump and let it play out, everything went a lot smoother. Platforms are generally spaced out in a way perfectly suited to the odd jumping arc. Additionally, the jump dash or boost do a perfect job allowing players to go from the air to forward in a quick and intuitive way. The stomp allows the player to halt forward progression with a button press, and the homing attack is excellent, allowing the player to snatch items and then homing attack, avoiding the jumping altogether or reach new heights in a different way. Even the momentum is excellent, Sonic is a little slower than usual to reach maximum speed, but this does make it easier to navigate on small platforms or move around 3D space without things feeling slippery or twitchy. After many hours with Sonic Colors, the controls did feel natural, predictable, and responsive, and I have no complaints. The switching from 2D to 3D and back is also smooth and seamless thanks to the camera. In fact, one of the issues critics of the day mentioned in every single previous 3D Sonic game was the camera. While I personally rarely had camera issues and would often have to go out of my way to find efficiencies, I can safely say Sonic Colors addresses this issue by removing camera controls from the player entirely. By keeping the level structure simple, there is nothing to get the camera stuck on, and thus manual camera controls aren't needed for corrections. Whether this trade-off is worth it will likely come up to player preference, again harkening back to those two generations of fans I alluded to earlier. However, while the designers did a great job designing levels which work in tandem with the camera instead of against it, they didn't always work within the limitations of the limited resolution offered by the Wii hardware. On a few occasions, the camera is zoomed way out, and Sonic is reduced to a few jumbled pixels, making it hard to see where he is and where he is supposed to go. While I appreciate being able to see the level structure the developers wanted me to traverse through, avoiding screen crunch, it would have also been nice to see the hedgehog I'm supposed to control. This inconsistency can be found in the story segments as well. Starting with Sonic Adventure, Sonic Team started getting really heavy on story. Rather than just battling Eggman, the player was tasked with battling gods and otherworldly creatures hell-bent on destroying the world. This gave some real weight to the stories, where Sonic's failure could potentially mean the end of humankind as we know it. Sonic Colors mood feels more like the Sonic the Hedgehog TV series from 1993 to 1994, during Sonic's heyday. Eggman is a bit more aloof, Sonic's dialogue is more campy, and the weight of the world isn't resting on Sonic's shoulders. For gamers who grew up with this cartoon, Sonic Colors will likely bring back feelings of nostalgia. For gamers growing up on more meaty stories, the corny jokes and brighter moods might be a turnoff. And regardless of preference, there are most definitely jokes here that don't quite stick their landing. No copyright law in the universe is going to stop me! In closing, I would say Sonic Colors is starting to show its age, and it is not the media darling it once was. While I stand behind those first impressions I wrote in 2013, with dozens of hours of game time behind me and a more critical eye, there are certainly some problems. I do think this game has an easy pickup and play accessibility missing from past 3D games. However, I also feel Sonic Team failed to make a game which is deep enough for multiple playthroughs. While replaying levels with new wisp powers and new goals goals is interesting enough, and the player is able to better utilize skills like the jump dash and boost to progress through levels quicker as well as boost in more opportune moments, there is little here to challenge the player and really test their platforming prowess. The level of interaction is at times severely lacking, with automated moments lingering for a little too long without the pleasure of spectacle. I could only identify a couple of moments where concepts introduced in one act were expanded upon in later acts. This includes these laser enemies, which start as a pair and are then expanded to triplets, and this jump spring which requires precision timing to avoid extruding blocks. And I'm really reaching here. Don't get me wrong, I do appreciate the lack of padding, like forced multiple playthroughs or tedious fetch quests, but I still come out of Sonic Colors wanting more. Still, while lacking in depth, Sonic Colors also lacks in frustration. There are some charming moments. Tails is finally able to hold his own and isn't a whiny sidekick. The soundtrack kicks ass and the art direction is terrific. The wisps are simple to use and don't require motion controls. I just wish the game offered more depth. I still recommend Sonic Colors to folks who have never played a Sonic game before, but for Sonic diehards and platforming veterans, Sonic Colors is a little shallow.